So let's get started here. We're going to be talking about corporate finance. And what you're going to figure out is that corporate finance is known by many different names. Just want me, please, my turn. If you guys want to talk about what beer you're going to drink later, you can do that starting at 12.15. Okay, it's corporate finance, financial management, managerial finance. We use these terms interchangeably, and they all mean the same thing. So don't let that freak you out. Let's talk about the balance sheet model of the firm. So hopefully you guys remember just the slightest inkling of your accounting class that assets is equal to liabilities plus owner's equity. So let's talk about what assets are. They are things that the firm owns and expects to bring economic benefits in the future. The things that the firm owns that they expect will bring them economic benefits in the future. So if you've got a factory, we would call that an asset. If you've got a copyright, that's an asset and so forth. Then we have liabilities, and that's money that you owe to somebody. Now, it can, it's mostly to investors, but if you've got taxes that you owe, taxes do things like that, those are also liabilities. So basically, any money that you owe people. And then finally, we have equity. And equity is an ownership stake. It's a residual claim. What does residual mean? Let's go simple here and say leftovers, how about that? So what's left over? Residuals are what's left over after, as she said, you sell all of the assets and you pay off all the liabilities. That was what gives us equity. And if you buy shares in a company, you actually own part of that equity. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now we're going to talk about the big three questions that we are trying to answer in corporate finance. And the first question is, is what long-term assets should be purchased by the firm? What long-term assets should be purchased by the firm? We call that the capital budgeting question. Now note that the word capital shows up in all three of these question names. And so we're going to say this one is capital budgeting. What does that mean? At a company, uh, we're going to find out that the goal is to maximize shareholder wealth. And so I should only be purchasing assets that help me to maximize shareholder wealth. And so that's the capital budgeting decision. Now there's a lot of work that goes into figuring out whether or not these projects are going to uh, maximize shareholder wealth. That all falls under capital budgeting. And then we have the question of how we're going to finance the assets that we're going to purchase. Number one tells us what we should buy. Number two tells us where we're going to get the money. And we can either go out and borrow money from a bank. We could issue bonds, which is another form of borrowing. Both of those are liabilities. Or we could issue additional shares. And that would be using equity to finance that, finance those assets. And so we call this the capital structure question, the capital structure question, and I'll tell you that the capital structure, you might want to write this one down, the capital structure is the mix of debt and equity that we use to finance the assets of the firm. The capital structure is the mix of debt and equity that we use to finance the firm. the mix of debt and equity we use to finance the firm. By the way, if I say something three times, I think it might be important. Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. And then finally we have, how do we manage the short-term operating cash flows of the firm? By the way, in accounting and finance, when we say short-term, what do we mean? Year less. Yeah, a year or less, right? So we're the one year is the breakover between short-term and long-term. Okay, so now this is about um, the short-term operating cash flows of the firm. So we're talking about things like cash, inventory, accounts receivable, accounts payable. And we call that the working capital management question. We call that the working capital management question. Now, which of these do you think is most important for the firm? You've got a one in three chance of guessing and getting it right. Oh, very good. Why do you think so? Because it's short term and 
the long term doesn't really matter if the short term doesn't go well. Damn, she's brilliant. Okay, so here's the trick. My wife and I are planning. Oh, whoo, she's ahead of the curve. I like that. <laughs> that means that any time that you folks don't know, I can always go to her because she's ahead of the curve. Okay. Not always. <laughs> so back to the story. Uh, my wife and I are planning retirement. Uh, by the way, this marks the beginning of the second half of my career at MSU. I've got 15 years down, I've got 15 years to go. Woohoo! I am on the downhill side. Right? <laughs> okay, so we're planning to retire, and we've got all sorts of plans and this, that, and the other. But what happens if today I step out in front of a barrel line bus and get killed? Free tuition. Or. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for you? I don't know. You... <laughs> so. You, you are, you're always ready with an answer, like last time that people are stupid or paying the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Maybe reserve some of these. <laughs> okay, I don't know where free tuition comes into that whole thing, but if I'm dead, I wouldn't be able to take advantage of it, right? Okay, back to the story. If a barrel line bus hits me, the sh my short term is over. There is no long term. And the same is true for the company. If the company basically runs out of cash and can't pay their bills, then the company dies. What do we call the process of the death of the company? Bankruptcy. Yeah, bankruptcy. When you run out of cash to pay your bills, you go bankrupt. And so I think number three is the most important simply because if we don't do it right, there is no need to even talk about number one or number two. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions? So let's talk about financial managers in the organization. And this is a pretty generic org chart. You guys know about org charts from one of your management classes or whatever. Well, anyway, this is pretty generic and it's probably a little old fashioned for what we see today. And I'll explain some of the differences as we go along. But it's, very, it's always true that at the top are the board of directors. Now, the board of directors are elected by the shareholders. So the shareholders are the owners of the firm, and the owners of the firm always get to make the decisions at the firm. Unfortunately, we've got so many shareholders, we can't always just take a poll of all our shareholders to figure out what they want us to do. And so instead, the shareholders elect this board of directors, and the directors are supposed to work in the interests of the shareholders. And the interest of the shareholders is maximizing their wealth, and we'll talk about why that is here in a bit. Now, there are a couple of jobs of the board of directors, and uh, the biggest among them is to hire, compensate, and fire managers. To hire, compensate, and fire managers. Uh, you guys hopefully know what hiring is. That's when you go out and you find the right candidate, you bring them on board, and you have a big welcome party, and then we're, you're into the work world. Um, compensate, what do you think? What are we talking about with compensation? Yeah, how do we pay them? Now, do you think managers just get a paycheck? No, there's probably gonna be some sort of stock options, probably gonna be some sort of bonuses, there are gonna be goals that they've gotta hit, kinda like we do with our athletic teams here, that you know, if they win a championship, the coach gets an extra five grand or some, some stuff like that, right? Did you guys know that? Yeah, yeah. They don't give me bonuses for winning anything, but then again, I don't win anything, so I kinda, Figures. Okay, so the board of directors are going to hire, compensate, figure out how to pay these people. And by the way, uh, the way that we pay them is going to have some impact on their behavior, which we'll talk about in the second part of this lecture. And then direct, uh, directly above them, above, or below the board of directors, they say chairman of the board and CEO. These roles do not always go together. I want you to scratch through that chairman of the board right now. Scratch through that chairman of the board. We're going to talk about why those things don't always go together and should not go together. And we'll hit that later on in this lecture. And then below them are the president and chief operating officer, usually the same person. So let's just call that COO. Now let's talk about the difference between a CEO and a COO. The CEO is providing the vision for the company. They're the ones that are out there kind of perusing the market, looking for the opportunities, that sort of thing. And that's a, a lot of reason why we see CEOs typically don't come from an engineering background, they don't typically come from a finance background, they typically come from more of the marketing and sales side because they know the market and they can see the opportunities there. 
the chief operating officer is more concerned with the day-to-day -day decisions of operating the company. In other words, making things work and work well. So in, in, uh, in my marriage, for instance, my wife is the visionary. It was her idea to go to doctoral school and become professors. It was a great idea. I am more like a COO. I execute. I make the trains run on time. I get things done. And so you'll see there are, are people, I do not have the skills to be a CEO because I lack the vision. I would make a good COO. Now let's talk about the vice president and chief, op, uh, chief financial officer. So forget that vice president part. Let's just talk about chief financial officer. This is the highest ranking person at the firm that is concerned with the finance and accounting issues of the firm. So it's the highest ranking uh, officer at the firm that is concerned with accounting and finance only. Because of course everybody's concerned with it, right? And then underneath the CFO, things break down into two houses. And the first house is the treasurer, the treasurer's office. And the treasurer is uh, the top finance to the top pure finance person at the firm. The treasurer is the top pure finance person at the firm. The controller is actually the top accountant at the firm. They're actually the top accountant at the firm. And you may even see the word spelled like this. The original word is, it looks like comptroller. But that's not how you pronounce it because the word is French. Anybody here speak French? No. Okay. So in French, this is I'm sorry. It's it's controller is how it's pronounced in my accent's awful. Okay. So that is why we just switched to calling it controller. So don't let that freak you out. Okay. Now under the treasurer, we have people that are responsible for doing those corporate finance things that we just discussed. For example, the cash manager. Which of those three questions we just talked about do you think the cash manager is most interested in? Capital management. Which kind? The working capital management? Oh, working right. capital yeah, management. Yeah, the, the third. By the way, net working capital, working capital, we use interchangeably, right? And it's all current assets minus current liabilities. We'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so uh, the treasurer is, is over the cash manager, and the credit manager is also concerned with the third question because the credit manager is all about receivables, right? And so when we sell something on credit, we get an accounts receivable instead of getting cash. What's the danger when we extend credit to people? Yeah, these deadbeats won't pay us back. And so it's the job of the credit manager to figure out whether or not uh, the companies they're selling to are deadbeats. By the way, if you offer looser credit terms, do you sell more stuff? Yeah, if you offer tighter credit, credit terms, you sell less stuff. So uh, the credit manager at the firm that I was at last, he was always wanting to give out credit with an eyedropper. And I was a salesman. How did salesmen get paid? Commission. Commission. What am I wanting him to do? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they're great for it. They're good for it. Don't worry about it, right? By the way, when you go to a car lot to buy a car and you're going to borrow the money, how do they know whether you're good for it or not? Yeah, your credit score, right? It turns out for companies we have something similar called Dun and Bradstreet or a Dun's report that you can use to determine whether or not these people have a history of paying their bills or not. Of course, you have to have an expensive subscription to that, and of course that means MSU doesn't have it. <laughs> okay. Um, then we have capital expenditures. What do you think capital expenditures? Which question do you think? Capital budgeting. Yeah, it's a capital budgeting question. Now, do the people in this group actually come up with the ideas? Absolutely not. These people are the ones who are looking at the ideas that are flowing up to them from the different operating units of the company. And those ideas can come from as low as the, the bottom people in the firm. Uh, we've, I got a great idea from a guy that worked on the shop floor. I'll tell you about that later in the class. But you're going to do an analysis on all those things, and then all of those projects are going to be handed up to the capital expenditures group, and they're going to figure out whether or not this is a good project for the firm to undertake. 
And then we have financial planning. Financial planning decides where to get the money to uh, buy the things the capital expenditures group approves. Which question are they most concerned with? Yeah, the capital structure question, question number two. So that's the treasurer's side of the house. Now let's talk about the controller's side of the house. Um, controller is an accountant, the top accountant at the firm. And underneath them, we have the tax manager. Why do you think it's important to have a tax manager? Ashish. Not get sued. Or Not get sued or go to jail. jail. <laughs> if you guys are under the uh, misguided notion that federal prison is light and easy, uh, even at minimum security, let me know. I'll bring in my buddy who did seven years and he ran a Ponzi scheme. He can tell you, <laughs> yeah, he can tell you how tough it is to be in federal prison. So we love our tax manager, they keep us out of prison. On the other hand, there's a tension here. Does the company want to pay more taxes or less taxes? Less. Yeah, less. And so the job of the tax manager is to figure out how to legally pay the minimum amount of taxes possible. So uh, when you're doing your own taxes, if you don't itemize, you're not going to get to write off your mortgage interest. You're not going to get to write off your charitable deductions and all that. And so you need to, you can make choices that legally minimize your tax burden. And that's what we expect out of our tax manager. And if you ever hear of someone saying they have an aggressive tax manager, get away from them. Because what are they doing? They're playing fast and loose, right? If you look at Enron, fast and loose. Okay, then we have the cost accounting manager, and you're like, phew, that's got to be pretty easy, because we know the cost of the raw materials, we know the cost of our labor, blah, 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 blah. and for the variable costs that go into our product. By the way, do you guys know the difference between fixed costs and variable costs? Does anybody not know the difference? Okay, so for the variable costs, pretty easy. The fixed costs, we've got to figure out how to allocate those costs to other things, and so that's where your cost accounting manager comes in and I was constantly arm wrestling these people because they were constantly trying to throw costs onto me that I felt had nothing to do with the product I was producing. I have no interest at all in whatever it is that you're throwing this money at and of course it makes me look worse because it gets subtracted out before they figure my profit. And then we have the financial accounting manager. The financial accounting manager is in charge of producing the annual reports for the firm, the annual financial reports. And by the way, these reports have to be submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a branch of the United States government, once every three months. And since we've got Sarbanes-Oxley, they have to be signed and attested to by the CEO and the CFO. And if they turn out to be fraudulent, those folks can do prison time. So do we want a good financial accounting manager? Absolutely we do. Now, they're going to make some tough calls on how to account for things because accounting for things differently can impact the reported earnings of the firm. It can impact the taxes that you pay. And so a uh, financial accounting manager is important. I actually knew the financial accounting manager at Goodyear. He was in my MBA class. I actually know him. He's still alive. Uh, now he is at Orlando with uh, Universal the Theme Park. Yeah. He's like over all their theme park financials and whatnot. I need to get back in touch with him and get some tickets. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Use your networks, people. Okay. Uh, and then finally, we have the information systems manager. If I say information systems, what are you thinking about? IT. Yeah, IT. Now you may say, what in the world is IT doing under the accounting department? Because we use IT for basically everything, right? So it turns out that in the beginning, Computers were used by the accounting department. In fact, my mother got so she taught for one year of high school and she figured out that was for the birds. And then she went to become a bookkeeper at the local stone quarry, which is where you dig out big blocks of limestone to make beautiful buildings like Harrington Hall, I think came out of the same quarry. Back to the story. 1964, and they have just brought in this brand new computer. And the computer fills a room about this size, and there has to be massive air conditioning because the computer creates a huge amount of heat. And this thing's probably about as powerful as your calculator. 
But in the beginning, they're only using it to write the tickets. To, if the tickets is, uh, is how they charge their customers. So it's basically the bills. And then they figure out, oh, by the way, we can track all of our transactions on this computer, and we can actually start to turn out some rough financial statements. And so that's how uh, the information systems wound up being under accounting. It's just a historical thing. Now, you remember I told you that this might not be an exactly modern org chart. And the reason that it's not exactly modern is because most companies now have a chief information officer or a chief technology officer, and perhaps uh, that information systems would be under that person instead of being under accounting. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, by the way, chapter one is a hodgepodge or a potpourri. In other words, it's a bunch of stuff that doesn't necessarily go together. So now we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna talk about some legal terms. And first we're gonna talk about limited versus unlimited liability. If the firm's equity investors, we're talking about the owners, the shareholders, if they are responsible for the debts of the firm, regardless of how much the firm owes, that is unlimited liability. Let me give you an example here. Uh, let's say General Electric is worth $500 billion. I don't know what they're worth. Let's say they're worth $500 billion. Now let's say that they do something extraordinarily stupid and they get sued and they end up owing $750 billion. Those stockholders, even though the firm was only worth $500 billion, they are on the hook for all 750. So in addition to the 500 million that the firm is worth, they'll have to cough up an extra 250 million dollars. If, on the other hand, we have limited liability, the most that the equity investors will ever lose is the amount of their investment in the firm. In other words, uh, so I'll give you an example. I bought 10 shares of GE back in 1998 for $83.75 a piece. So my total investment was $837.50. If GE gets into trouble, they have unlimited liability. I will only lose my initial investment. I'm not going to be on the hook for this extra money that may be beyond the value of the firm. Does that make sense? So which of these would you rather have? Limited liability or unlimited liability? Yeah, you much want, really want to have unlimited liability, so, or limited liability. So let me tell you a story here. I moved to Mississippi. I used to be a professor at the University of Southern Mississippi, and I hired this guy to do my yard. And this guy's name was Mark, and he had a 1976 Toyota pickup truck and a trailer that he bought from the local uh, Future Farmers of America welding class, and he also had a $10,000 uh, Dixon ZTR zero turning radius lawnmower, of which he was extraordinarily proud. This thing was like GPS enabled heat seeking. I don't know what else. It was amazing. Now, he, uh, that, those were basically the assets of the firm. So let's say that all that together is worth about $15,000. Now, Mark is mowing my yard one day, and he is listening to ACDC because he was rocking out on the lawnmower. He can't hear anything. By the way, it's already loud, right? And then he feels the whole lawnmower shudder. <clears throat> and he's, he's startled. And of course, he stops immediately. And he looks and sees blood and fur all over the lawn. What do you think's happened? Something's dead. Something's dead. Very good. Okay, now, he looks past the field of fur and blood and sees my neighbor's wife and the three little children standing at the edge of the yard. <laughs> Their mouths are hanging open because Fluffy, the family dog, had escaped and ran straight underneath the mower. And that's what led to all this fur and blood everywhere. By the way, Fluffy didn't make it. Okay, so what do you think? Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you all about Fluffy. Fluffy's real name was Sir Charles Fluffmeister, 
and he was some sort of championship show dog. He's retired, and he'd been put out to stud, which is a pretty good life for a dog, right? If you don't know what that means, look it up. <laughs> okay, so he'd been put out to stud. His market value was around $50,000. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, so back to the story. Mark says, oh ma'am, I'm so sorry. Do you think sorry's enough? No. Do you think they're going to accept $50,000 as compensation for the loss of this dog? No, why not? What else are they going to sue for? Those children are going to be therapy for the kids. Therapy for the kids, right? Please. Oh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what happens in court here in a minute. Okay, so they're definitely going to sue Mark. Now, here's what you need to know about Mississippi, and I assume it's similar in Louisiana. You can tell me, Mr. Taylor, if it's similar in Louisiana. Can you buy off a jury in Louisiana? Uh, I'm not sure. He hasn't tried yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. So in Mississippi, Mississippi is referred to as a judicial hellhole, and you can you can actually Google judicial hellhole, and Mississippi pops up. Okay. So here's what goes on in Mississippi: you get the best justice money can buy. So what does that mean? You remember those tobacco lawsuits? They all got filed in Mississippi. I wonder why, right? Okay, so here we are, Hattiesburg Courthouse, and this family is suing Mark. And of course, here are my Southern Lawyer imitations. I apologize in advance if you are a Southern Lawyer and take offense. Okay, so the, the lawyer for the dog, well actually the dog's family, right? The lawyer for the dog's family, they're doing their closing arguments, and he says, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Certainly, you recognize that this dog was no mere dog. This dog was a beloved member of this family, more like a sibling to these poor children than a family pet. In addition to his economic value, undoubtedly, there are pain and suffering here that needs to be compensated. There are damages. We need to compensate them. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, certainly, this pain and suffering is worth $2 million. Therapy's expensive. Therapy's expensive. Very good. Which, by the way, tells you that being a therapist might be a good career choice because they get paid a lot. Back to the story. Yeah, I don't recommend it because you take Southern other people's... Southern lawyers sound more profitable. What's that? Southern lawyers sound more profitable. Exactly. Especially if you're crooked. Okay, back to the story. And no, I'm telling you, don't be crooked because you end up with federal prison. If you still think that's a good idea, let me know. Okay, back to the story. So, the, uh, the jury convene or you know they, they go off and do their thing and they come back and the four person of the jury reads the verdict and says we find for the plaintiff and award damages of two million dollars. Now the judge who sounds suspiciously like the lawyer says two million dollars why that's excessive instead of two million dollars I'm only going to award one. Now remember how much Mark's company's worth $15,000. Okay, so Mark goes home and his wife says, how was court? And he said, we lost. And she says, how bad? And he says, one million dollars. And she says, well, I guess you're going to lose your company. He says, no, it's worse than that. The lawyer tells me I have unlimited liability. Which means not only can they come after the assets of the firm, they can come after our house, they can come after the kid's college fund, they can come after my retirement, they can come after your beloved suburban, and that's when she breaks down and cries, right? That is the danger of unlimited liability. Okay, I'm gonna let you off the hook here. The dog didn't actually die. That story was entirely bullshit. Now, why did I put you through such psychic trauma? Well, I actually had a young lady sit on the front row and start crying during the story. I said, oh, honey, it's bullshit. Don't worry about it. Okay. I cried the first time I watched it, but also my dog was hit by a car last oh. fall. So <laughs> yeah. we were, the trauma is real. Yeah. Okay, so I grew up on the farm, and so animals just freaking died all the time, right? And so 
I, I, I understand that other people feel more things more deeply. Okay, back to the story. Why did I tell you that awful story? Because you'll be marked for life with the concept that you need limited liability. Would you like to know how to get it? Yeah, and that's what I'm going to do next, is to teach you how to get limited liability. And it comes down to what sort of legal form you choose for your firm. There's more than one way that you can uh, legally organize your business. And we're going to talk about four here. Now, uh, there, there's more than just this, because there are general partnerships and limited partnerships. The things that we're going to talk about here today is a general partnership, and I'll try to remember to tell you how limited is a little different. But we're going to talk about different aspects of these different forms of business, and some have advantages and some have disadvantages, and we're going to see what those are. First of all, let's talk about a sole proprietorship. Can anyone tell me what sole means? One. One. And a proprietor is? Person. A person? A business owner. A business owner. So uh, a sole proprietorship is a one owner company. So a sole proprietor, you say, well, uh, I'm not going to organize myself as a sole proprietor. The trick is if you don't organize yourself under one of these other ways, you are automatically a sole proprietor. So for example, this winter, we have a little snow. Uh, Cliff cancels class because he does that. And you decide you're going to get out and make some money. And so you go out and shovel sidewalks. And you are shoveling in exchange for money. It's not an employment relationship. Uh, you're, you're out there as a contractor, basically. You are automatically a sole proprietor. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. And you can do it quite by accident, which is exactly what Mark would have had to have done what well, Mark would have had to have done in order for that to have been uh, unlimited liability for him. And so we see that limited liability is not one of the things that you get with a sole proprietorship. It's not one of the things you get with sole proprietorship. And um, you would think that this means that we don't have many sole proprietorships. But in fact, the sole proprietorship is the most numerous form of business. Why is that? Well, most people that start a business, uh, let's say that you're really good at baking cakes and you, you don't have a business education, you don't have a legal education, you're just out there whipping up cakes, people love them, you're making all sorts of money. You are automatically a sole proprietor. And so a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of small businesses are sole proprietorships and all of those people have unlimited liability. Now let's talk about double taxation. In order for me to talk about what double taxation means, I need to go down to the last one, the corporation, and we'll talk a little bit about it, then we'll jump back up. At the corporation, the company pays taxes called corporate taxes, and then they turn around and pay dividends to the shareholders, and the shareholders pay taxes on the dividends. This is what we refer to as double taxation. So it's taxed first at the corporate level and then at the investor level. In a sole proprietorship, the profits are the firm, profits of the firm are taxed like regular income to the sole proprietor. The profits of the firm are taxed like regular income to the sole proprietor. Okay, so there's not double taxation, so that's an advantage of sole proprietorship. Now, is it easy to transfer ownership of the firm? And you might, so let's talk back about Mark again. Um, Mark has the, the lawnmower, the trailer, and the pickup truck. We said it was worth $15,000. Is that the full value of Mark's business? No, what else is going on there? Well, he's making money. He's making money, I like that. Yeah, goodwill, and we'll not use it in the accounting sense. Well, if, if you bought his business, uh, you would have $15,000 worth of fair market value of the assets, and everything you paid over and above that would be accounted for as goodwill. The question is, why would people pay more than $15,000 for Mark's business? Brand image. Say again? Brand image. Yeah, the, so Mark's, uh, Mark's brand was extreme lawn care, and I don't know why it was extreme. It's not like he popped wheelies on his... <laughs> More or anything, but that was his brand. 
And when uh, we would recommend to other neighbors, like, yeah, Mark does a great job, and they'd say, well, what's the name of this company? And i tell them Extreme Lawn Care. Now, most people that hire someone else to do their grass cutting aren't actually there when the people show up. And so what if someone were to come by and offer Mark money, they could take over his route, and as long as they maintained his same quality standards, people wouldn't care, right? And so that, company, that brand image that he's built up has some value. Now, my question to you is, do you think that most small business owners have any idea what their company's truly worth? No, they don't. And so they have to uh, typically go to someone who's called a business broker. In order to get the full value of the firm, they're going to have to go to a business broker, and the business broker might say, Mark, you know, your, your company's actually worth 100000 bucks." Now, uh, by the way, how do brokers get paid? Commissions. Uh, real estate commissions, 6% in Missouri. What do you think business commissions are if you sell a business? 10%. So Mark's going to have to pay this guy 10000 bucks if he manages to sell his business. However, Mark is still better off because he's got $90,000 in his hand versus the $15,000 he would have had. Does that make sense? And so he's $75,000 better off. Now, here's the next problem. How easy is it, do you think, some, it is to get someone that wants to buy a lawn mowing business in Hattiesburg, Mississippi? You think those people are just falling out of the sky? No. And so this is why it's not easy to transfer the ownership and get the full value of the equity because you have to go out there and put, uh, the broker goes out and tries to put buyers and sellers together. A little allergy trouble today. Okay, so that's why this ownership transfer isn't necessarily easy. And I would almost guarantee you that the great majority of small business owners that you know have no idea what their business is truly worth. If you start asking them, they're going to tell you what they invested in the different assets, but they don't know what the overall value of that enterprise is. Okay, then the next thing we'll talk about is perpetual succession. Perpetual means goes on forever. Perpetual means goes on forever. And so if a company has perpetual succession, that's basically saying that this company legally, in theory, could go on forever. And we're going to see there's only really one, one of these that has that. Uh, it's not the sole proprietorship, though, because the sole proprietorship ceases to exist when... Any ideas? The owner dies. Yeah, when the owner dies. By the way, if no one has shared this shocking truth with you yet, we are all going to die. Barring some supernatural event, we are all going to die. And so all sole proprietorships eventually come to an end. Now, what if the owner leaves the firm to his child? It becomes a new sole proprietorship underneath the kid. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, it, it's over when the owner dies. Now let's talk about easy capital raising. You are, so let me tell you about a guy that actually I worked with here, and, and he was my student here, and he was going to open up a, a new landscaping business. And he went down to the bank and said, told the loan officer, I have a dream. And the loan officer says, tell me your dream. He says, I want to have the best landscaping business in Springfield. And the, the loan officer said, that's a great dream. He says, what do you need in order to get this dream moving? And he said, I need a $10,000 Dixon zero turn radius infrared heat seeking GPS enabled mower and I've already got the truck in the trailer. And the, uh, the loan officer said, wow, he says, that's, that's good, you've already got that figured out. He says, by the way, how much money do you already have? And my student said, nothing. Right? He's got nothing. Would you loan money to someone who could not put their own money into the enterprise? No, definitely not. Why? Why do you think they make you put 20% down on a house? Oh my goodness, let's do a little basic business instinct, behavioral instinct here. If you don't have any of your own money in something and things go wrong, what do you do? Don't care. Yeah, you don't care. You just walk away, right? 
Does that make sense? Okay, so what, um, the, so in order to get these people to have some skin in the game, we call it, we make sure that they pay for part of the asset. And so the, the loan officer was probably expecting him to have two or three thousand dollars to put, and we call it putting down, putting money down on the lo on lawnmower. In that case, if he defaulted on the loan, um, he would lose some money, and that would encourage him to keep making the payments. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, it's not easy for such firms to raise capital because they're small. The assets of the firm, or the, the wealth that's involved here is limited to the owner, right? The equity is limited to one owner. And my, my student didn't have any wealth. And so it was really hard for him to go out and raise capital. By the way, can a sole proprietor sell shares in their company? No. So there's no way for him to get external equity either. And so really their only choice is to go to the bank and get the money. Or after my student got turned down, he went to the lawnmower dealership. And he was he walked in there and he was looking at the Dixon Zero Turn infrared heat seeking GPS enabled mower and he was standing there and tears were streaming down his cheeks. And the salesman comes up and says, son, what's wrong? He said, I wanted to buy this mower to start my business, but the bank told me no. What do you think the salesman says next? You can finance it. You can finance it! Now, why would the business be willing to finance him when the bank was not? What's the business getting out of this other than perhaps interest and principal back? They can take the asset back. Okay, well the bank could do that because of repo, right? Wouldn't you love to be a lawnmower repo person? <laughs> Talk about your low speed chase. <laughs> why, why is the business interested in loaning the money when the bank would not? What else do they get out of it? Why do we sell stuff? To make a profit. If you don't know that, you need to get out of business school, right? We sell stuff to make a profit. And so the, the business is not only getting the interest in the principal, they're also getting the profit. And by the way, what's the sales guy getting? Commission, right? All the interests are aligned. Now, the, um, the financing is probably going to be more expensive at the dealership than it would have been through the bank. But of course, he couldn't get the financing from the bank, so after all, now he has to go with this. And so that's why we see it's extraordinarily difficult for these folks to raise capital. But is it easy to start? Yeah, it's as easy as falling off a log, right? Remember, I told you, you could just go out and immediately create a small proprietorship and not even realize that you've done it. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about partnerships. Any idea what the big difference between partnerships and sole proprietorships are? More than one person. Yeah, more than one person in a partnership. My sister is in a partnership. She owns one-fourth of a firm. So there are now four owners, let's say. It could be as few as two, but let's talk about four. Now, if it is a general partnership, they still have unlimited liability. And here's where you figure out that it pays to get into business with people who are a similar wealth to you. So I'm 51, I've been working for a long time, I have some money, and how old are you, Mr. Owens? 20. 20. Are you like loaded with cash? Uh, no. No. Okay, so <laughs> let's assume that we get into a partnership here, and uh, it's 50-50, because you know, I'm, I'm a great guy here, 50-50, and we, uh, we get into trouble. And there's a huge lawsuit against us. And they say, oh, you got to pay a million bucks. Do you have 500,000 bucks? I don't know. He does not. Who are they going to come after? Mm -hmm. Old deep pockets here, right? And so that's why it's dangerous to get into partnerships with people who have different kinds of, different magnitudes of wealth than you do, uh, especially if you're on the, on the rich side you may end up carrying more of the load if there's a problem down the road. By the way, do you think the same might be true for marriage? Just telling you marriage is a partnership, right? So if you think about it, your friends, I had a friend that um, married a young lady, he was poor, he married a young lady whose father was wealthy. What kind of life did she expect? A good one, the same kind that dad had provided her. 
and he wasn't able to do that. Okay. Let's say we were talking about partnerships. They still have unlimited liability, uh, but they don't have double taxation. And so the profits from the partnership get divided up amongst the partners, and then they all pay um, regular income tax on those profits. Now, when I say regular income tax, I'm not talking about, there's also this thing called self-employment tax. So when I work for the university, I'm paying, I think it's like 7.5% to uh, Social Security. The university is paying an additional 7.5% on my behalf. If you're self-employed, guess what? Yeah, you're on the tab for 15%, right? Okay. Now, so there's no double taxation there. Uh, it's not easy to transfer ownership, and in fact, it might be a little uh, more difficult because there's more than one person involved. So, Mr. Jaquez and I decided to go into business, and I'm 51 and you are 49. You look extraordinarily youthful. I'm going to pick someone who's not going to bullshit me. Percent into the business. No, 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 no. I'm 51 years old, and you are uh, 22. 22. Okay. So, I, I plan. <laughs> so, we'll, 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 no matter what, how you're lying to me, we'll go ahead and assume you're 22. <laughs> okay. So, um, I. How many more years do you think I expect to work? In fact, I think I told you earlier today. 15. 15. Right. I would plan to work 15 more years. Uh, you and I have this great business, and then at 15 years, I'm like. Mr. Hawkins, I'm done. Uh, I want to sell the business. And you say, wait a minute, I'm only 37 years old. I've got kids, I've got a wife, I've got a mortgage. I want a lake house, right? Is he going to be interested in selling? No. And so we're going to be at an impasse there. And so it's, uh, it's even harder to transfer ownership because you've got to get people to agree. Um, is there a perpetual succession at the partnership? No. In fact, it's even worse than a sole proprietorship. Because sole proprietorship, 100% of the owners have to pass on. Only one partner passes on, and the partnership as a legal entity is done. Right? And so you have to form a new partnership at that point. Now, is it uh, easy to raise capital? It's not, but it's easier than a sole proprietorship. Any idea why? Yeah, you got more than one person's wealth, right? And so um, let's go back to Mr. Umfleet and I. Uh, if we go down to the bank and we are going to co sign on this loan, uh, if something happens to me, what's the expectation? He'll continue to make the payments. But if it's just me on the loan and I die, there's a chance, there's a good chance that they won't get paid. Additionally, we've got two people's wealth here now instead of just one. And so we've got more equity to start out with. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's a little easier to raise capital, but it's still not terribly easy. Is it easy to start one of these things? It's easy, but it's not as easy as starting a sole proprietorship. And here's why. You're going to have to write down the rules of the road for the partnership because otherwise what happens at the end, people always claim that they were entitled to more than they actually were. And so what you've got to do is put together what you've decided upon into a partnership agreement. Now, you want this partnership agreement to hold up in court, so who do we have to get involved in writing it? A lawyer. Are lawyers cheap? No. And so you've got to find a lawyer, you've got to get this written up, and you're actually going to have to hammer out the agreement. And so all that goes into making this a more difficult thing to do. Excuse me? Yeah. So um, you're talking about partnership. In, case of, in, in an event of death of any, any of the partners, uh -huh. can his or her daughter or son take over? Very good. OK, so let's assume that we've got four partners, and one of them passes on. In that partner's will, they can leave the interest of, of the partner, leave their interest in the partnership to a child, and that child can inherit. However, it now will have to be a new partnership, because as soon as one person in there passes on, the partnership as a legal entity is gone. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Okay. Let's see. Let's talk about limited liability companies. Now, this is the hardest question I'm going to ask you all day. Do you think a limited liability company has limited liability? Yes, it's in the name, right? It's in the name. So, the most that you ever lose as an equity investor in a limited liability company is your equity investment. You're not going to lose beyond that. So this is the first one we see that has that protection. That's the first one we see that has that protection. Now, let's talk about uh, what limited liability looks like. So here we have a sole proprietorship, and here we have a partnership. And you can think of these things as cakes. And so the cake here has more than one owner. The cake here has one owner. But if I can put some icing on top of this thing, I can turn either one of them into an LLC, Limited Liability Company. And so a limited liability company could have one owner. It could have multiple owners. And other than the limited liability portion of it, everything else would be exactly the same. And so basically, you're just losing that limited liability. Do you think getting, or losing the unlimited liability, do you think it's valuable to have limited liability? Yes. Yeah! If it's valuable, certainly it must cost a lot and be difficult to do. It's not true! I have my own LLC! I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with it, but I have one. And, and how, did it, how much did it cost me? 50 bucks. And how did I do it? I went to the Missouri Secretary of State website. Okay, I think the robot's lost its mind. Okay, she's back. Okay, so oh, by the way, Something I learned in manufacturing, all the robots had girls' names. I have no, I no idea why. Weird stuff. Back to the story. What was I talking about? Your LLC. Oh, yeah, yeah, my LLC. Oh, so I go to the Missouri Secretary of State's website, and all I have to have is my name and my address and an email address where they can contact me. That's it. Right? $50 on my credit card. Bada bing, bada boom. I have, whoo, lifted unlimited liability from myself. <laughs> Does that sound cool? Yeah! Okay, now, I'm giving this talk to a group of Chinese EMBA students, and I think they were actually all lawyers. Oh, oh yeah, they, they were a lot of fun. They'd argue about everything. Okay, so back to the story. <laughs> uh, back to the story, uh, they said, certainly no one would be stupid enough to do a sole proprietorship when it's so easy to get rid of limited li or get rid of unlimited liability. I said, no, in fact, most businesses in the U.S. are sole proprietorships. And they're like, you're lying to us. It can't be true. <laughs> Luckily, just about that time, there was a knock at my door. And it was one of my former students, a guy named Nick. He was my first semester here, so it tells you 2007, right? He came in and he says, oh, can I, can I join in? And I said, sure. He pulled up a chair. And I said, what have you been up to? He says, I have opened a store. He was from some islands, and he was going to sell native stuff from his islands to fellow islanders from there who were in the U.S. working. And uh, he, was, he was all excited about it, and he was telling me all about his store. And I said, let me ask you a question. Are you a sole proprietor? And then all the color drained from his face. He says, oh, yes! Mm. He had been so excited about starting the business that he had forgotten to take the simple step of LLC. And after he left, uh, my Chinese said, well, maybe Americans are that stupid. <laughs> it's not just Americans. It's everyone that's excited about starting a business and has no idea how the law works, right? Mm -hmm. OK. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, yeah. So talking about LLC and sole proprietorship, uh, in an event where somebody who has LLC uh, runs into trouble, so who has the unlimited liability? Ah, okay. So uh, it's the liability of the owners of the firm, if they have unlimited liability, extends to the entire amount owed. But if they have limited liability, it only extends to how much that they have invested. So the question is, you're asking is, who loses here? 
the person that won the lawsuit, right? Instead of getting the full amount, they can only get the value of the liquidated firm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, other questions? Okay, let's move on to corporations. Undoubtedly, and by the way, this is a question that people get wrong on exams all the time. What is the most numerous type of business in the US and everyone answers corporation, when in truth it's sole proprietorship? Now why do they say that? Because you guys are so familiar with corporations. Tesla, Coca-Cola, um, you know, I could just keep naming them, right? And you guys know those are all corporations and you see and hear about them all the time. Do you see and hear about all of the multiple sole proprietorships there are? No, right? So that's why we see corporations are actually the least numerous type of these businesses. Now, the good news is for a corporation, it also has limited liability, meaning that they're not going to lose more than their initial equity investment. And so as a shareholder, what does that mean? It means your stock price can never go below zero. Stock prices can never go below zero because of limited liability. If you had unlimited liability, in theory, stock prices could go negative and you'd have to actually pay someone to take the stock off your hand. Okay. Um, double taxation, yes, we talked about this earlier. There's corporate taxes and there are dividend taxes and when you put both of those together, they easily exceed, usually, um, the regular income tax that a sole proprietor or an LLC type organization would pay. And so there is a tax disadvantage to being a corporation. There is a tax disadvantage to being a corporation. And so, so far, uh, it sounds like we could get all the good stuff uh, and none of the bad stuff if we do an LLC. But let's start talking about some of the benefits that come along with being a corporation. First of all, it's easy to transfer ownership. Remember earlier I told you about my 10 shares of GE? If I get angry at how GE is doing business and I decide I don't want to be an owner of GE anymore, what can I do? Sell your shares. I can just sell my shares, right? Sell my shares and get out from underneath it. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I can't do that with my sole proprietorship. So this is the easiest transfer at all. By the way, how do I sell my shares? How do you sell your shares of stock in a company? Oh my goodness. Mr. Sadak. You, you asking how do we sell yeah, how are, So let's say you've got 10 shares of General Electric. How do you shall, sell it? I just trade. You trade. He's, he's using his thumb. <laughs> <laughs> so when my generation says you trade, it's like this. Yeah, and when his generation says you trade, it's okay. <laughs> just yeah. Yeah. So are you on Robin Hood? God bless uh, you. We're going to have to talk. Yeah, I, I'm getting out of it. Yeah. Good, good. Smart man. Okay, if, if you're on Robin Hood and you don't know why that's an extraordinarily bad idea, yeah. come see me. Okay, back to the story. By the way, Robin Hood steals from the? And gives to the? In this story, you think you are the? But you're actually the? Yeah. Kind of stinks, doesn't it? Okay, back to the story. Oh, where were we at? Oh, so, yeah, you just log in to your account, sell your shares. Takes you about, what, three, four seconds? Yeah, yeah you're, you're a fast thumb typer. <laughs> three, four, right? Okay, you sell it. Easy, easy, easy. Now, is there perpetual succession? Yes, a corporation can go on forever and ever, except for if two things happen. One, uh, they go bankrupt, right, and get liquidated. Or number two, the owners decide to dissolve the corporation. Those are the two ways that corporations cease to exist. There was actually a Scottish bank that was over 500 years old, would still be in business today if it wasn't for a trader in a back room in Singapore making a bad mistake that totally wiped out the entire equity of the bank, they'd still be around. So theoretically, you could have a corporation that's hundreds of years old. Okay, now, is it easy to raise Capital, absolutely. Corporations, not only can they borrow from banks, and by the way, do you think, uh, let's talk about who's, uh, Tim Cook. Tim Cook, do you know who he is? CEO of Apple, right? Tim Cook walks into the same bank where my student was and goes in and says, I'd like to talk to you about borrowing some money. 
What do you think the difference is in the reception between my student and Tim Cook? Tim Cook is a well compensated CEO with Apple having trillions of dollars or whatever. Yes, and when he walks in, do you think the loan officer looks at him any differently? Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. He's like, Mr. Cook, let me get you brandy and a cigar. We don't allow smoking in here. But for you, I'll make an exception, right? <laughs> and uh, so they're going to treat him a whole lot better. So it's a whole lot easier for corporations to borrow from banks than it is for sole proprietors or partners. And then, oh, crap. I, I think we'll be able to go without it from here. Um, so, so beyond that, um, they can also issue stock. This is the first of these things that we see where they can actually issue stock. And so they are able to raise what we call external equity. So in not just those four initial founders of the company, now they can sell shares to all sorts of people like you and me, and they can raise money in that way. And there's another way that corporations can raise money, and it's called through the issuance of bonds. Bonds in the public debt market. So they can borrow money by selling bonds. Okay, now let's talk about why you would have a corporation. Remember, I told you that from a tax standpoint, a corporation stinks. Oh, by the way, we did talk about easy, easy to start. The corporation is the hardest up here to start. You have to find a state that you want to incorporate in, typically Delaware or Nevada. By the way, why is Nevada a, a good place to incorporate? Yeah, well, it has to do with something called reciprocity. They have no reciprocity with the Internal Revenue Service. And so they will not rat you out to the feds because of your uh, dodgy tax dealings. So what kind of people do you think typically form Nevada corporations? Crooks, right? Okay. So we also, now I'm sure someone will leave a comment on my video that says, I'm not a crook. I'm not. Yeah, fine. Great. I'm sure there are like three decent people who have those. <laughs> Delaware. Why is De Delaware is a fly speck of a state, right? Why is Delaware so popular? Because Delaware's laws are friendly to corporations. Other states might be not so much. And so people will choose to incorporate in Delaware. And in fact, I think Delaware has more corporations than any other state, and even though it's only like this big. Okay, so that you have to, uh, you have to uh, sign up with the state to form a corporation, and then there are reporting requirements where you have to report certain things to the state. You don't have that with sole proprietorship for sure, and I sure hope you don't have it with an LLC because that means I'm behind on my reporting, right? Because I haven't ever told them anything about my business that doesn't exist. You neither. Okay, so we'll go to jail together. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe not because they don't have co-ed jails yet. But oh. <laughs> we're getting there. Okay, back to the story. So, why on earth would you be willing to jump into this corporation thing, knowing that your taxes are going to be higher, and that you've got more government regulation to deal with? By the way, and if you if you sell your shares publicly, now you've got. The SEC all over you too, right? Why in the world would I do that? Any ideas? It has to do with that easy capital raising. If the business is growing so fast that we cannot keep up with that growth through our own wealth and the debt uh, that we can raise through our bank, then it makes sense to maybe go outside. Now, it's like this. Uh, let's think about uh, Facebook back in the day. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and let's call the other guy Frank. And they each own half. And so Mark gets 50 cents of every dollar of profit. Frank gets 50 cents of every dollar of profit. 50-50 split, right? Now, Mark and Frank, they, they get Facebook together. They realize exactly how narcissistic and vapid people are, that they've got this huge growth possibility, right? But between the two of them and the money they can borrow, they can't grow that thing fast enough. So what do they do? They start a corporation and they go outside to raise money. Now at this point, let's assume that they sell off 50% of the corporation. So the outside shareholders have 50%, Mark's got 25%, and Frank has 25%. How is it better for Mark to have 25% than the 50% he originally had?
you walk into a pizza shop, and what do they got nailed up on the wall? The sizes. Yeah, the different size pizzas. Now, my question to you is, is it better to have half of a small pizza or one quarter of the extra large? Yeah, a quarter of the extra large. I'm always amazed when I walk into pizza restaurants and, and I'm standing there and, and the person in front of me is like, how many pieces are on that? It's a medium pizza. They're like, how many pieces? I'm like, it's this big. We can cut it into as many pieces as you want, right? It doesn't matter. Okay. So the point here is that 25% of the big pizza is more than 50% of the small. That's why you're willing to go out there and become a corporation because you've got to go outside to raise enough capital to be able to keep up with the growth and afterwards your stake, even though percentage-wise is diminished, will actually be worth more money. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions about what we've been talking about that used to be on the screen? If you were going to have, if you've got a successful company and it's not growing like crazy, which of those should you stick with? LLC. By the way, can you switch from being a sole proprietor to being an LLC? Absolutely. Easy to do. Can you switch from being an LLC to being a corporation? Absolutely. You, you just fill out the paperwork, right? And could you actually go from being a corporation to being an LLC? Absolutely, because you do a going private transaction where you buy up the stock out on the market and become an LLC again. And that happens. That happens all the time through private equity transactions. Are there any questions? Okay, have a great weekend. See you guys on Tuesday.